Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you a diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for the craft. And whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer to the work, we're confident that you'll find something to inspire and captivate you in each and every one of our interviews. Today, we're going to be talking about an issue that has brought Hollywood, the film industry, and the television industry to a standstill in May of earlier this year. Our guest today is Calgary-born Emmy Award-winning writer, producer, and director Rob Cohen. Rob has written for numerous television shows, including The Ben Stiller Show, Mad TV, The Simpsons, The Jamie Kennedy Experiment, and The Big Bang Theory. He has also directed such shows as Fresh Off the Boat, Blackish, and two of my favorite shows that I think were canceled too soon, Speechless and The Goldbergs. Rob, I want to thank you so much for joining me today and talking about the writer's strike and about you as well. Of course, uh, it's uh, uh, an honor with a you to be here. (laughs) I, I want to start with the big question. So uh, in May of this year, earlier this spring, uh, the Writers Guild of America uh, filed notice that they were going on strike and they have been on strike since May 2nd, 2023. Uh, for you, uh, was this a much needed action to sort of give a indication to the Hollywood studios that writers weren't going to take it anymore? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I will say, obviously, uh, a strike does not benefit anybody in the short term because people stop working and earning an income. And it was the same thing with the strike in 2007 and 2008. And that's just the writers on strike. But I definitely think this is due because times have changed. And in my opinion, in a lot of writers' opinions, uh, the producers and studios have not changed with the times they they know the times are changing but all they want to do is keep as much money as they can um even if their business model may be broken so i think in this instance it, it's absolutely necessary there's a lot of uh misinformation and miscommunications that's going around through news outlets through uh uh sp- podcasts through uh twitter through social media about the issues that writers are sort of wanting addressed from the studios for you what are you looking for from the studios and in and i say you is the collective royal you as in the writers guild of america um i really think it boils down to three things and uh, there's an overlap from the last time so currently people need to get paid for residuals. Uh, They are trimming residuals from all sorts of shows. I've worked for Netflix a bunch of times. I had a great experience, but the problem is you work just as hard, sometimes even harder, and you don't get residuals. So that's not really fair. And I think that as there's more streaming platforms, they are offering you money up front with no residuals. So what used to be called backend or syndication doesn't exist anymore. So you really need to make your money up front. But the problem is because these studios or these networks or streamers don't qualify as a big boy network, they get to pay you less up front anyway. So you're taking it twice uh, up front and then nothing on the back. And then that's connected obviously to your pension plan and your healthcare. And the other big thing is AI, which is already being used it's been used for a long time but they would love to not pay writers and actors and directors unless they have to and feel that that shortcut is a way to save money it may not get you better product but i think most of their goals and this is a generalization are just short-sighted it's how do we boost the stock right now how do we put more loose cash in our coffers right now and then when Q1 rolls around, they can claim victory, give themselves bonuses, and then start over with fresh money. And that's a generalization, but um, I think it's really AI and um, salaries slash residuals, which are just getting, you know, gutted. Now we are we're recording this in September and it's going to be airing in September. And traditionally, this is when the fall season premieres start rolling out. Um, and I know that talks are still ongoing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But do you have a sense, or as you're out on the picket lines, does the WGA give you a sense of a timeline, or are you just out there until this ends? Because 
uh, there's no turning back now after five months almost on the picket line. I think you have to be out there the same way the actors are out there now um, until it ends because the trick to a good negotiation is keeping things quiet so there isn't speculation. And obviously there's been so much speculation that people, you feel it on the picket line, like there's hysteria where it's like, my cousin's friend lives next to a guy who said that there's a deal by midnight. And then everybody's like, oh, well then I'll, I'll just stop picketing. And I think that that's generally what the studios want you to do is to just feel like it's either pointless or there's victory ahead. But the picketing is critical because it, it does two things. I think it galvanizes the unions, uh, SAG and Writers Guild, but it also has you reconnect with people you haven't seen in ages that are suffering more than you or having different experiences than you. And I think it helps keep you out of your bubble um, to remind you how important it is to protect these last little bits of um, power or strength that exists. So I think it's really important um, because otherwise, like, how do you, how do you protest something publicly besides having your negotiating team negotiate, uh, especially when they're not really allowed to negotiate for a hundred days. Now, I, I, I want to talk about a little bit of a, a sensitive subject over the last few days. Two relatively big names have decided to, they were going to go back to filming their show, but they decided against that, whether that be Bill Maher or Drew Barrymore. Um, and I know the writers and the you know, actors were sort of angry about this. What does this mean for morale when you see people like a Drew Barrymore, like a Bill Maher, who openly say they're going to go back and now have rescinded that, saying that they're not going to go back and they're actually going to stay on strike with the writers and the actors of uh, America? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in on those conversations, so I can only guess what my, my guess is what happened is. How does it make you feel as a writer though? I'm not offended by it. I just think it's, um, I think the Bill Maher statement is interesting because he told people what was happening. The Drew Barrymore statement is she apologized for what was happening. And I think the mistake was she then opened herself up to people that are really uh, emotional or hot-headed or whatever it is. And they look at her, she's weak. And with Bill Maher, they look at him as good for him or he's just an asshole. And I think that both of them were trying to do the right thing, which is keep their crews paid somehow. And I know a lot of the late night hosts are paying out of their own pocket to keep their crews having some money in. So it's all for a good reason. I just think uh, you have to put the message out there correctly because we've been picketing so long that you can't just go, I've decided you're the strike isn't important to me and I'm going to do this. And then people that are really uh, um, affected by their lack of the same decision-making get really angry. And um, uh, the other thing is, I think, you know, Bill Maher is a member of the writer's guilds. So he might've had a conversation with them. I think Drew Barrymore is obviously a member of SAG, but you have to be sensitive to all these people that are out there earning zero dollars, sweating it, uh, and have a, a more delicate conversation, I think, with your union's leadership. And to answer your other question, those big showrunners like Kenya Barris and Noah Hawley and whoever else was involved in that, I understand that they are frustrated, but I also think that could have been handled better more privately because they could have just reached out privately and said, hey, can we have a chat with you because we have a lot of shows and that means a lot of crew. Uh, I also think the AMPTP loves anything that makes it look like the guild is fracturing. So they, they would love to fan that fire. And that's not even being said like in a paranoia way. I just think it's, if someone doesn't want to give you something and you're freaking out and it's helping them go see, they don't deserve this thing, then uh, it only helps their case. So I think it's going to get, I think cooler heads are prevailing this week. Uh, hopefully it sounds like they're going back to the table Wednesday or Thursday. And hopefully both sides realize there will be a deal at some point. Maybe it could be sooner than later. And then hopefully it's a tolerable deal, but 
it's just, you know, it's emotional after five months, their friends of mine are sort of uh, kind of accepting that they're never going to be on the staff again as a writer. Um, so it's a pretty crazy situation. What's the morale like at the picket line right now? Honestly, every time I've been on the picket line, it's been great. Um, this sounds like a joke, but the only negative thing is sometimes the strike captains will bring their own music and it's music that only they like. And uh, I can only hear CNC Music Factory so many times before I have to say I'm done picketing today. Um, but other than that, it's been great. I mean, there are theme days. We've done three Canada days. Uh, we've done, you know, like people are making it as positive as it can be. But I think the people that don't want to pick it just don't show up. Um, but I think the vibe is actually pretty unifying. And it's a fun is the wrong word to use, but it's been fun. You know, our Canada days, we had, uh, you know, uh, we flew in Timbits and Smarties and um, all sorts of stuff. And the non-Canadians were like, this is the greatest. We were handing out flags and you just see people realizing like, we're all out here. Let's at least enjoy it. Do, while the end does not seem in sight right now, there seems to be a, uh, a light that with them going back later this week. Um, what happens if a deal, once a deal is reached, because uh, I'm assuming production start back up on TV shows that start back up on uh, tell, um, films as well, but this doesn't happen overnight. This is going to be a long progress. What happens in the short term for writers when they go back hypothetically with whatever deal they come back with good, bad, or ugly, what happens next? I think the first thing that happens, because remember there's two unions that are still on strike. Yeah. So even if the writers make a deal, you still have to have the actors make a deal. And I don't think SAG would just take a deal because they're a very different union. And that gives them the most bargaining power because now two out of the three unions have made a deal, but you can't make the shows without actors. So uh, I would say they get staffs together as quickly as possible. They start jamming out stories. Maybe people get paid to work through the holidays. Maybe they don't. but um, some shows I know that already have the season pre-written if it's a short order on a streamer and others, if it's a multi-cam on a network, uh, they will go as quickly as they can to break stories. And then depending on when you have actors, uh, they will either start shooting maybe November, early December, and then decide what to do for the holidays. Uh, or depending on you know, some shows are weather dependent if you're shooting outside. So if you have winter to deal with, that may push things even further. Um, you know, uh, there's a show that I have been lucky enough to work on that is supposed to take place in Kansas and it films in Illinois, but we film it in the summer. So if suddenly things were miraculously fixed, we're going to be in Illinois in the winter. So they could rewrite it. But uh, I think people that just have to look at what are the resources available and the actor's deal, I think, will take a little bit of time. I, I want to ask one question and then sort of wrap this up because I, I know you're cautious of time here for yourself. No, whatever but how, 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 how does a kid from Calgary, Alberta, become an Emmy Award winning writer and be on the front lines? Because I, I, I follow your uh, Instagrams. I see what you're doing. How does a kid from Calgary, Alberta become a big writer in Alberta or in Hollywood or a director? Well, you're clearly talking about my brother, Joel, because uh, he's the one who's become big time. Um, I, It's such a long story. The short version is I was a total goof there, um, no skills, and uh, barely escaped uh, Henry Wisewood High School. And then just after many years of Bouncing around in LA, I was lucky enough to be exposed to a producer here who offered me a job as a production assistant. And I didn't even know what that was, but he hired me on a show called The Tracy Ullman Show. And that was the very first time ever that I saw a TV show being produced. And I was assigned to the writer's room. And that was the first time I saw that. And they were so generous in sort of teaching me what they did, this weird job, because I love TV so much, but I didn't know how it was made. 
And then I just realized I thought this would be an incredible opportunity if I could ever find a way to do it. And through years of working there and secretly starting to write scripts and just seeing if I could even do it, um, they bought a sketch off of me uh, after two and a half years there. And that led to me starting to get tiny writing jobs that led to other writing jobs. And then I was a writer for 18 years on different sitcoms and TV shows and movies. And then um, was very appreciative of that. And I would ask myself that question you just asked all the time. And then in the last writer strike in 2007, 2008, I had been directing a little bit on the side and was kind of tired of sitting in a writer's room forever. So I just decided I would try to pursue directing and just change careers. And so that took about a year or two to really switch over. But I, it's been the greatest work decision I've ever made. I've been doing that now for 15 years and I, I love it. So I'm able to use my writing and producing skills, but as a director, and it was a very long uh, path from Southwest Calgary to this. You're known one one of your films that you're known for that I I remember quite well when it came out in 2015 was being Canadian. Now, do you when you write and when you when you because you're a director now, but I'm assuming you still write on the side as well. Do you do you write from a Canadian perspective, or how do you how do you transform yourself into different perspectives that you write for? Because I, I looked at your IMDb page, and you have written for some of the biggest shows and some shows that I didn't even know about that I'm looking forward to getting into. So, how do you write for different perspectives? Being a kid from Southwest Calgary, uh, well, if I was from Northeast Calgary, it'd be a whole different story. But hey, um, hey, hey, that's where I'm from. Hold on, here. Where are you from? Whitehorn. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then so, we're, we're enemies. Um, I mean, it's honestly, if you have a good showrunner who is teaching you how to um, write for different characters and what the tone of a show is or the tone of a movie, you just, it's sounding more simplistic, but as long as you adapt to have your, yourself sound like the character of the show, you'll do great. If you don't, if you go, I write this kind of thing, then you should go do movies because TV is, you have to be a sort of a chameleon. And if a show gets canceled, you go on the next show and now you're writing for a whole different set of characters. So I think it's just using your ear and the Canadian part of it. Um, I, I just think Canadians have such a great secret super weapon because we look like Americans, but we have a dry, weird British sense of humor at times. And that'll sneak into comedy where if it's US comedy, it's largely smart jokes. But if there's like a weird little dry joke or a self-deprecating joke that is not the norm, I think that's where the Canadian stuff comes in. And also when they discover that you're Canadian, you've been sitting in this writer's room for five months, people will flip out and feel like they've been betrayed. And, um, think you're an alien or something. So I think it's good to keep everybody on edge, but it's really just listening for what the tone of the show is and the characters. And that's the best way to do it because, you know, so many shows that I've worked on only went one season and then you're out hustling for another job. So you have to adapt for another group. So that would be my, my quick answer. Can I ask you about speechless for a second? Because when I said that, I saw you sort of raise your eyebrows a little bit because I'm pretty sure not a lot of people remember the show, but it was a show that I watched religiously. What was yeah. it like working on that set? Because like, or it, on that show, because I, I watched that show and it was probably bar none, the funniest thing I probably remember watching a few years ago. And I was so upset when they canceled it so quickly. Yeah, yeah me too. It was just a great it was a great experience. Um, my old buddy, John Ross Bowie, played the dad. You had great people like Cedric. Um, Minnie. <laughs> oh, yeah, Minnie. Like, it, it was honestly, um, I had a blast. Uh, the person who created that show, Scott Silveri, if not the greatest showrunner ever, I would put him in the top three as far as being nice, uh, supportive, let people do their thing but with a very firm hand. And I just loved going back there because it was a different kind of show. It wasn't just like entrance joke, entrance joke, exit. And uh, I love that it was filmic at times and we did some weird stuff. 
but it was a blast. I, I was lucky enough to do six of those and, um, it was just a really nice experience with a great different kind of story, uh, based on Scott's life. And, um, you know, it was, we, we got to just do a lot of interesting things and we, we worked on the Fox lot where I was a PA originally. So it was just like great to be back there. And, uh, I really had a good time. I was really sad when they canceled it. I was as well. Um, while we wait for the end of this writer strike and the screen actor actress uh, strike as well, what do you, what do we find you doing right now? Because I know you're you're helping, and I, I I'm going to pronounce the host's name wrong here. I apologize, but you're working with uh, Smartless Media on Bad Dates with Jamali Jamil, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's Jamila Jamil. Jamila Jamil. Yeah, that's okay. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that is an idea that I started during COVID. I just did it myself uh, as a kind of proof of concept kind of goof. And then when my friend, um, a rich Corson took over Smartless Media, he was asking if I had any podcast ideas because they were branching out beyond just Smartless with the guys. And um, I just told him that idea and he said he loved it. And so we uh, ended up... Um, you know, doing it. And uh, so we're, I think we just recorded our 40th episode. We're doing a big live show in Toronto uh, next week at the Elgin Theatre. It's our third live show. So it's just been this sort of strange experience that is keeping me busy while this is going on. Can we see the live show in Calgary potentially? I would love to go to Calgary. Um, We've done New York, LA. We're doing Toronto just for laughs. And then I think anything is fair game. You know, it's um, it's just who's interested in in booking us, but I would I would love to go to Calgary. I will find a booker for you, so that way we can get you back to Calgary, so you can yeah, have look, more we'll stories. We'll go to Loose Moose, or we'll go to Ranchmans. I, we'll go to Ranchmans, exactly the perfect location. Um, Rob, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your of busy schedule to do this. Greatly appreciate it. Of course, thank you for the interest. I I appreciate it. Go Stamps. Go Stamps is right. Hopefully, they can beat the Elks tonight. I know. Ugh, the worst. <laughs>